Um, okay, well, thank you so much to everyone here. Uh, this has been an incredibly stimulating day. Um, hopefully, I'll uh, do you some justice in this final presentation um, before we can go get a drink together. Um, so, despite generations of theorizing and scholarly debate, the complex processes that resulted in the rise of city states in the archaic Mediterranean remain largely obscured by the murky waters of prehistory. While the classical city state is reasonably well evidenced in historical and archaeological source material, many questions around the how and the why these communities coalesced remain unanswered. The available evidence from various places around the Mediterranean between the late 7th to the early 5th century suggests a number of key trends. Movements away from monarchies, tyrannies, or mafia-style warlords, the rise of governments appointed by a citizen body, written law codes, distinctions between public and private spheres, elite contributions in the form of liturgies or eurgetism, and major infrastructural investments. This list is admittedly far from exhaustive, but it serves to foreshadow some of the themes that will emerge from my talk today. I hope to demonstrate that Rome can be a fruitful case study for exploring the evolution of the city-state in a new light. In his seminal monograph on the beginnings of Rome, Tim Cornell summarized the situation plainly. While it is certain that Republican governments were eventually set up in all the cities of central Italy about which we know anything, and that there is no trace of monarchy anywhere after the early years of the 4th century BC, nevertheless, the details of the process are unclear. In the nearly three decades since Cornell made this observation, our visibility into early Rome has advanced significantly. Several new excavations across the city have successfully reached and systematically studied archaic levels. In addition, the incorporation of environmental methodologies has begun to revolutionize our understanding of Rome's early landscape. The growing corpus of evidence permits a new empirically grounded narrative that manages to explain some major developments in communal activity at Rome. Specifically, I employ new geoarchaeological evidence from the Tiber River Valley to argue that ecological pressures in Rome from the second half of the 6th century spurred collective action, power sharing, and an evolution in state level structures. In this way, I understand the process as an example of transformative resilience, where a social system under pressure changes to achieve a new equilibrium state. Resilience is admittedly an ambiguous term, as it encompasses simultaneously elements of change, as well as stability or uh, continuation. I will, however, attempt to use the concept as an analytical tool by spotlighting what we can reasonably assume to be essential properties of the system, those that which are resistant to change, and contrast that with the adaptive properties of the system which actively respond to stress. This analysis extrapolates from the results of the Four Moorian Project, a geoarchaeological investigation of Rome's central river valley, which I have directed since 2013. By drilling boreholes more than 15 meters below the modern street level, we have produced sediment cores that stretch the entire depth of archaeological stratigraphy and sample the underlying geological stratigraphy of the river valley. While I will introduce some of these new data points and landscape reconstructions into the discussion today, for greater insight, I would direct you to the open access article in last year's issue of the Journal of Roman Studies, which I co-authored with Laura Malta and Nick Ternato. In short, I aim to employ a combination of hard archaeological and environmental data points with low-level inferences about ecological stress and societal response to, such, to shed some light on three key components here. The complex social and economic system that existed in Rome around the late 7th, early 6th century BCE, the appearance of new environmental pressures, and what we might imagine to be the resultant system at Rome around the late 6th, early 5th century. So let's begin. At the opening of the Archaic Era, 
prior to intensive urbanization at Rome, the river valley looked much different. Here we had the meeting of three fluvial systems, the Tiber and two tributary streams, one from the Velabrum and another from the valley of the later Circus Maximus. At the point of confluence, where these fluvial systems met just north of the Aventine Hill, uh, in this area here, the ground level was heavily eroded. So the Tiber's bank was low, and the ground level rose gradually as you moved into the central part of the Velabrum. The sediment that characterizes the riverbank and up into the Velabrum Valley is characteristic of a floodplain, an area outside of the river channel that remains dry the vast majority of the year, but at risk of inundation from overbanked floodwaters during periods of heavy precipitation. Based on new evidence from the Form Loiring project, it seems that prior to the 6th century BCE, the Tiber would rarely, if ever, reach elevations as high as 8 meters above sea level. Given that the main building material um, of the a prehistoric era was mud brick or wattle and daub, structures would not hold up well to any amount of immersion in water. But the early inhabitants of Rome operated with a clear understanding of the Tiber's flood behavior and made strategic decisions about the placement of architectural investments in the valley. Areas perceived to be even slightly at risk of inundation were not appealing for permanent building installations. There was, however, ample space along the edges of the valley that offered a safe place for constructions. Indeed, some of the earliest architectural evidence from Rome comes from the shoulders of the Velabrum Valley above eight meters above sea level, including a temple atop a stone podium on the riverbank, as well as a late seventh century structure in the area of the Regia and an early sixth century structure possibly belonging to the Curia Castilia. Those two sites are marked with the stars there. On occasions when the valley experienced a major flood, people and movable goods would have been readily cleared from the floodplain and high value structures like temples would have stood safe above flood waters. While such an inundation may have hampered movement in the river valley for a short while and almost exclusively during the rainy winter season, floods did not risk great destruction or hinder connections from forming between the prehistoric settlements on the hilltops. Although there are few prehistoric material traces in the valley outside of these architectural features, we can draw on the environmental evidence to make some reasonable assumptions about human behavior on the landscape. The presence of a wide river channel and low sloping bank was arguably well suited to support both harbor and forward activity. People and livestock could, in theory, take advantage of this low shore and wide point in the river channel where waters could spread and dissipate, enabling them to cross between the regions of Etruria and Latia. Boats traveling downriver or up from the sea could be hauled ashore, beached in the shadow of the Palatine, even without relying on any built port infrastructure. It is worth emphasizing that an abundance of activity in the river valley would have occurred reliably in months of the year with the least precipitation, when Rome's floodplain would have been an open, dry plain. So as we try to draw larger conclusions about the social and economic system operating on this landscape, I suggest that the movement of people, pastoral flocks, agricultural products, natural resources, and foreign goods through the river valley could be readily controlled and told. To do so would entail low level cooperation or agreement, particularly with regard to shared space and defense. There would be a need for reliable, open access to and movement through the river valley and such a landscape that is defined by its accessibility, vulnerab vulnerabilities to raiding warfare uh, would have encouraged cooperation for defensive purposes as well. Aside from these basic prerequisites, I argue that operations in the river valley in this era would have required minimal administrative oversight, labor, or infrastructural investment. We might imagine that a king or a group of clan leaders would be capable of monopolizing river-related economic opportunities, extracting tolls, 
accumulating precious materials, controlling redistribution, while relying only on small-scale support, whether royal officials or client or family groups. In other words, social stability and economic prosperity in this system could feasibly be achieved even with limited, seasonal, or weak state-level structures. Although the Tiber offered important opportunities for the growth of a city, the fact remains that river valleys are one of the most dynamic types of landscape that exists on our planet. Indeed, the coring data makes it clear that the fluvial environment was not stable. Sometime in the sixth century, the edge of the Tiber's channel began to shift westwards and the river valley began to fill with silts deposited during overbank flood events. The amount of land inflation is quite staggering. Um, nearly six meters of sediment deposited in the area of the Formularium over the course of the sixth century alone. And so the image I have here on the screen is um, a single core, um, you're just seeing the various sections stacked, um, so the top to the bottom. Um, and this is just to give you some kind of um, visual impression of what it is that I'm talking about. So here we have um, at the bottom a uh, horizon which is labeled A, which is extremely well dated by ceramics from across the cores um, to the early archaic periods. So we've got quite a bit of early archaic pottery in that horizon. And then up at the top, C and D is another very well dated architectural feature. This is part of the early fifth century um, construction at Santa Mavona, which we'll see a little bit later. So this is all just to say that this 5.8 meters of sediment, which is um, labeled B in the image here, um, is on one hand staggering, but also very um, narrowly dated. Um, it's really, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the uh, the importance of narrow chronological time frames, and this is really quite clearly sixth century activity. I'd like to highlight two ecological consequences of this sedimentation. First, there was significant impact on topography. In particular, the low lying shore in the southern part of the Forum Boarium was filled in, and a high river bank emerged in its place. The coring shows that sedimentation continued at least through the third century BCE until the riverbank district was paved and land inflation stabilized. This topographic transformation would have had significant repercussions for harbor activity. By the late archaic period, Rome's original harbor would have ceased to operate as it conceivably once had. Boats could no longer simply be hauled ashore but would have required new constructions of port infrastructure to enable mooring along the riverbank. Um, and this is just kind of an ethnographic um, idea of, you know, um, beaching a ship. And this is um, an image of much later riverbank infrastructure, um, much later using concrete. But this is just to give you some idea of the kind of transformation in the operations of the harbor itself. In addition to this topographical change, the sedimentation would also have had hydrological consequences. As the valley filled with sediment, drainage from the tributary valleys would have been blocked, and overbank floodwaters would have been pushed to progressively higher elevations. This process would jeopardize areas that were previously safe from inundation. Previously predictable flood levels, which shaped the possibilities for early settlement in the lowland, would have been surpassed as the Tiber established a new normal in the range of behaviors. Whereas floods prior to the sixth century rarely have ever topped eight meters above sea level, mid-Republic flood deposits are found as high as 11 meters above sea level. By the Augustan period, the primary sources record areas of the city at elevations as high as 20 meters above sea level impacted by floodwaters. This amount of fluvial transformation, the abrupt onset of novel sedimentation and flooding, represents an acute shock to the social system. As we begin to make inferences about the essential properties of our system, the available archaeological evidence reveals the archaic society's immediate response. At a minimum, it is apparent that inhabitants considered occupation of the river valley to be essential. 
We know that the Romans built their very first temple, or at least the first one we know of archaeologically, in the early 6th century on a high section of riverbank. This is the archaic temple from Santa Mavona, which we looked at a few minutes ago. I should stress that this early urban investment in the river valley is quite unusual. The archaeological record suggests that the vast majority of Iron Age settlement activity in central Italy was focused on hilltops or high volcanic plateaus. And I am, I have been searching for some comparanda of early, um, you know, pre-concrete, let's say, architectural investments directly in a river valley um, in a floodplain. So if any of you, if anything comes to mind, I would really like to hear this. Um, but I'm struggling to find something that compares to this. Um, in addition, uh, okay, although originally located in a safe position on a high ledge on the edge of the river valley, the archaic temple was abandoned by the end of the 6th century. In its place, a 5 meter high platform was erected to support two new temples lifted away from floodwaters. Um, and the image you see on the left here is just to give you an impression of the scale of this construction. This was a photo taken inside of this platform after we had excavated um, a five meter deep trench. Um, so that's just the kind of facade of this Capolacho uh, platform. Um, in addition to this massive overhaul of the riverbank sanctuary, other major investments in the lowland have been dated to the archaic period including drainage channels and a fill to raise the ground level in the area that would become the former Romanum. I see each of these projects as mitigation efforts to contend with novel sedimentation and flooding risks from the latter half of the 6th century. And I interpret these large-scale investments in lowland occupation as reflecting a desire to maintain river-related economic opportunities namely control of the movement of people, goods, and natural resources through the valley. Over time, what began as an acute shock would represent a chronic stress as flooding and sedimentation became repeated, seasonal, escalating issues. In other words, the maintenance of river-related activities would have required both an immediate reaction and continual or progressive responses over time. Indeed, the inhabitants at Rome employed a variety of coping strategies to deal with this fluvial transformation, all of which are identifiable in the archaeological record from the 6th century or later. These include building on raised platforms, lifting structures away from floodwaters, the use of water-resistant building materials, construction of bridges to facilitate river crossing, construction of embankment walls to stabilize the riverbank and provide mooring structures for boats. But any port works, as well as bridges across the Tiber, would have been extremely susceptible to destruction during flood events. The Romans probably grew to anticipate such losses and had little choice but to repeatedly rebuild river infrastructure. The river channel seems to have begun at least by the early 5th century. This would have also been necessary on a periodic basis to keep the channel clear for boats to maneuver. We also have evidence of the filling and reclaiming of lowland areas, as well as the installation of drainage infrastructure. We should appreciate that these coping strategies would have made a variety of demands on the social system. Substantial initial investments periodic maintenance and cleanup, repeated repair or rebuilding after flood events, new and recurring expenditures, a larger and enduring labor force necessary to handle construction, reclamation, water management, etc. And finally, greater administrative oversight of lowland areas. Now we need to ask, who would have paid for these resources? The challenge is of a scale that is beyond effective individual response. No one individual could adequately address complications resulting from an increase in sedimentation and flooding. But decision makers were individuals, those with sufficient wealth and power to act. 
our leads. The response could also have involved the wider community in the form of unpaid labor, but it would have been the socio-political elite, those holding power and wealth, who would have been capable of commissioning coping strategies. And who could expect to have been helped by these coping strategies? First and foremost, the elites, who are incentivized to invest in infrastructure and water management for their own economic prosperity. For this reason, I would add a third point to our previous list. We should understand elite interests, power, resource control, wealth, etc., to be an essential property of the system. Despite this, we must acknowledge that the fluvial pressures would have had an impact on diverse parts of society, not just the socio-political elite, but also others who presumably, presumably relied on operations in the river valley, the craftsperson, <laughs> merchant, shepherd, among others. Investment in resources that would mitigate the effects of floods and or facilitate economic activities, therefore, would have constituted a public good a service or feature that helps the broader community. In this way, public investment could have become a tool for elites to acquire or maintain their socio-political power. Flood vulnerable areas would particularly benefit from public investment, making areas like the Forum Bawarium and Forum Amanum logical early examples of public space. By the mid fifth century, we even have indications in the 12 tables to suggest state involvement with water that causes damage in public spaces. Here we have, if a water course directed through a public place shall do damage to a private person, the same shall have the right of suit to the effect that the damage shall be repaired for the owner. This is the only reference to a public place that is apparent in the surviving sections of the wall code. Certainly, we should appreciate that the private individual had little ability to mitigate the effects of flooding in this context, so we might interpret this law as the state taking responsibility to control water in Rome's valleys and maintain these public spaces on behalf of the people. In summary, let's return to the concept of resiliency. I have employed environmental and archaeological evidence in order to argue that the economic exploitation of Rome's river valley in the late 7th, early 6th century would have benefited elite interests, um, even without large-scale labor, uh, excuse me, large-scale labor and infrastructural investments. The river valley could have hosted a multitude of complex economic and social activities with limited collective action amongst inhabitants and feasibly with weak state-level involvement. I further argue that newly documented ecological pressures in the latter half of the sixth century would have jeopardized these pre-established activities and created novel challenges for a diverse spectrum of society. The system that emerges from this environmental crucible remains unchanged in significant ways, most notably with the preservation of a social order centered on elite interests. The maintenance of river-related opportunities would, however, require greater cooperation and collective action, specifically in the form of new and recurrent investments in labor and infrastructure. We should expect that elite interests in river-related enterprises would have led to greater investment in services and structures that represented a wider public good. And lastly, I've argued that this process would spur new or expanded state-level structures that could help to negotiate this cooperation and enduring management of the landscape and activity in the river valley. In conclusion, I'll conclude uh, by pushing this narrative one step further. Uh, this process of ecological pressure and resiliency I've described today helps to explain the communal ideology that must sit at the origins of the race publica, the public thing, the shared matter, the common interest. While the attendant legal and political institutions of the Republican system likely evolved subsequently, the foundation of a community of individuals with shared interests can be tied to these transformations in the sixth century.
could not see the creation of the race publica as a deliberate decision to create a more democratic or egalitarian system, but rather recognize how in the face of significant environmental dynamism, elite interests at Rome became aligned with the public good and required cooperation and collective action. Thank <laughs> you.